our, our guest today, uh, stopping by for a little bit, um, is an attorney, young, high powered, influential attorney, a young brother really making a mark, uh, uh, in the, in the legal film, legal field. Uh, I invited him on because I had questions and a lot of questions that come up when we had these conversations, you know, you, you'll sit there in a conversation and you'll hear people talking and you just think for a split second, you'd be like, mm, I don't think that's right. But a lot of us are not qualified to uh, to correct in these conversations. So um, a lot of these questions have to do with uh, law and legality. And so uh, I, I wanted to introduce a segment called Against the Law. And basically what that is, is putting everything that you have, all your preconceived notions and half facts and what you think and believe, put take those, put them in a ball and put them up against the law and see whether it's right or wrong. So uh, welcome to the program right now is uh, attorney Stephen Williams, Esquire, Prince George's County, Maryland. Welcome to the program, man. Let's go live. Hey, thanks for inviting me here. Good to see you. Hey, so first of all, man, we, we're just going to, you know, chew the fat a little bit. Just um, give me a little, give us a little background on, on, on uh, you know, how you got into your profession. Okay. Well, at this point in time, at this point in my career, I'm a prosecutor with the Prince George's County State's Attorney's Office. Uh, I started off um, in private practice um, after law school, worked for a couple of big firms, ended up down on K Street um, in Washington, D.C., representing a lot of uh, interests, uh, businesses, companies, uh, and even some criminal work, with, which was predominantly white collar. And I did that for about 25 years. Mm. And, um, and as I started, uh, uh, I guess about when Trump came into office about 2016, I guess it was, I started being a lot more involved in the politics. And I had a, um, a young, uh, another young attorney who decided that she was going to run for office and ended up being elected to be state's attorney in Prince George's County, that being, um, uh, the state's attorney, Aisha Brayboy. And, um, we had chewed the fat a lot about things that were going on. And, and she asked me to come into the prosecutor's office because um, that's where a lot of the decisions and a lot of changes need to be made. So that's how I am. Um, I was practicing a long time, but that's how I ended up being a prosecutor, which is where I am now. So you went from private to what, what would that be called? What would the other one be called? I went from private practice. I, I ran my own law firm, had um, as many as 10 attorneys working for me. And now I'm uh, now I'm a prosecutor. I work. But I mean, uh, like for the state. that's what oh, so you work for the state. That's what I was trying to figure out the language. Technically the county. But yes, it's, right. it's called state's attorney. But technically, the county is my employee. Now, so your job is to prosecute crimes against the state, so to speak. Well, yes, that's the way it's described. Uh, technically, I guess I prosecute crimes against um, um, against people, mm -hmm. members of the state, citizens of the state. But yes. So do do um, situations like like what we're seeing uh, play out in the national uh, media landscape? Do do you do you ever deal with those like police uh, incidents with citizens contact stuff of that nature? Are those or is that or you you end up defending them? No, no, no. I, I, I prosecute um, and our office prosecutes the police officers. Okay. That's done in a unit called um, public integrity. I'm in what's called strategic investigations and we prosecute organized crime, um, um, a lot of gangs and serial offenders, serious offenses, uh, things like that. So um, I don't prosecute officers, although in private practice, it's, it's funny because I had plenty of opportunity to to bring lawsuits against the state and the county while I was in private practice. So it's it's uh, some people look at it and say, "Wow, you flipped to the other side," but um, it, it really wasn't that way in my mind. Which is there one that you um, enjoy more more than the other? I can't say that. I th I think that um, when I was in private practice, I had the opportunity to represent individuals. Um, and I had a, a lot of time fighting through the system. A lot of people were had been arrested, charged with offenses, and I was helping one person at a time. One of the major reasons and the, the primary reason I came to the prosecutor's office is because now I have the ability to make systematic changes, okay. to have a systematic impact and help more than just one person at a time. There, There is nothing like being um, a prosecutor in the legal system. It is it is the most powerful of all positions in the legal system, um, as far as I'm concerned. Even more so than than the judge, um, the judges and defense 
defense attorneys. And, and the reason for that is if something happens, something you see on the news, something you see on the street, one of these videotapes pops up before a judge even has the opportunity to decide to make a decision. It comes across a product prosecutor's desk. It comes across my desk. I get the information. I get the uh, uh, videos and things that may or may not come out. I find I know about the case and I decide, is this something that is worthwhile to be charged or not? Mm. And if I decide not to charge it, it's not even a question of a judge dismissing it or a grand jury not hearing it. It just doesn't get heard. And you'll, you you see that that's one of the things that happened with uh, Ahmed Arbery uh, with his situation. Uh -huh. His case bounced around in the court system and three prosecutors decided that they weren't going to touch it. Uh, and it wasn't until the video tape came out that someone decided that they had to. But if they had never, if that tape had never been released, those prosecutors didn't necessarily have to ever prosecute it with the, uh, with the, with George Floyd, you know, um, you know, people were upset about the, the charges that were brought against him or not brought against him. And it wasn't until uh, there was a lot of pressure from from society, from uh, from protesters that they actually brought in Keith Ellison to right. uh, who's the attorney general. That would ordinarily not be his job, but he's a special prosecutor that was assigned to this case. And he brought the additional charges that are brought forth now, but the, the, those prosecutors had, had decided not to charge him with anything more than third degree uh, homicide. He, he wouldn't have been charged. No judge would have ever had a chance to decide. Now we hear, we hear language and I'm hearing words and we try to process. So when you say those prosecutors, but on the news, they say DA, is that one and the same? It, it just depends on the, the, the particular way that your, your jurisdiction is bro broken down. In Maryland, we have state's attorneys. In certain places, they have district attorneys. It's just how your political subdivision is called. So, so those are the prosecutors. Those are the prosecutors. Okay. So in that in that specific example that you brought up with Ahmad Arbery, um, the DAs, the prosecutors, didn't bring the charges because they had a special relationship. It it has been proven with one of the the alleged killers. Um, yeah. and so so how is that? How are things like that um, subject to quality control? Or are there any controls for things like that? Well, I, I'm going to tell you, it's going to sound really cliche and and, and, and anticlimactic, but um, throughout the United States, the prosecutors are elected positions. And if you want to make sure that cases that are important to you and your community get, get prosecuted, never mind the presidential election. That That's important. Mm -hmm. But for on, on the ground, the prosecutor that you elect, who in, in Maryland, we just had an election last week. Uh, well, this is an election year for the prosecutor this time, but those local elections are where it's at. That's who. You, that's when you pick the people who are going to prosecute and who are going to review crimes to see if anyone's going to be charged at all. Now, how do you, you have to do? It? How how is the, what is what is the standard for whether you know whether you said you can make the decision? What is the standard for whether or not? You 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 push forward with charges on a, on a given case. Is there a measure? Is it is it just how, how I feel about it? What I think I can prove? What? Well, it's 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 very subjective, and the the, the term for it, the term is um, prosecutorial discretion. Okay. The prosecutor who gets the case makes a decision as to whether or not um, they can make the case, or if it's worthwhile to bring it. Now, most of the time, in, in cases that are highly controversial, the state's attorneys will, uh, if it's something that has um, a public impact, the state's attorney themselves will be involved and they'll send it to a grand jury. That's what usually happens here. But it doesn't happen everywhere, obviously. Right. Uh, and if it doesn't happen, it just, you. we've all seen cases that have disappeared or we've never heard anything about. Um, or uh, I heard on the news yesterday, there was a, another in custody death and the the body camera had had not been released for a year mm. it was it was bouncing around <laughs> the prosecutor's office for a year and they didn't act on it so if they don't act on it it doesn't get acted upon now i'm gonna I'm come back to that because i got a question about that but gianni asked for you mentioned uh voting in your local elections what what should you look for in a local prosecutor election time comes around i see the name on the bill, bill, billboard on the side of the road, but I know nothing about them or the type of person they would be in that position. So what type of things do you look for before election time in a candidate? 
Okay, I think that one of the, the most important things, of course, is always social media, and you can you can listen to anything that anyone has said and look a person up now. But what I would what I would say is is very important is to send an email or somehow get in contact with any of the any of the people that are running and ask them um, what type of what is important to you, what type of numbers and statistics are you tracking, and what are you going to do with it? Okay. And the reason that then that, the reason that's important is when you ask a person that question and and, and the person says, well, we have uh, you ask them how many people are in the jail, and they say our our detention center and here in Prince George's County our our detention center capacity is up. It's roughly 550 people. Mm -hmm. And there's some programs that, that you've heard about that are national programs or different offices are, are bringing into effect to release or reduce the number of people being held. If you ask that person, what do you want to do with people that are being held, people towards the end of their sentences? Uh, and they say, I haven't thought about it, mm -hmm. um, or I don't know, mm -hmm. or don't have a specific plan, then that's a person that doesn't have a plan. And that's not the person that you probably want to elect into the office. Wow. OK, that's a that's a, that's a start and to your previous point uh, about different things happening in different places. How come there's no uniformity if, it, if it's dealing with law and legality? Right. You would think that it would be uniform. So how come these processes aren't the same across the board in different jurisdictions? Every state has different laws. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. And that's why attorneys have to take a bar in every state where they're licensed, because every state has. Uh, has different laws that apply. And it's as, it's as simple as that. Mm. I, I want to bring up one point that we also, uh, th that I think is, is, is very important now because um, the protesters, this is, an, this is another example. There's been a lot of protests going on in there. And um, you heard the president saying that he wanted protesters to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Right. And immediately when I heard that, I said, wow. OK, the president's saying prosecute people to the full extent of the law. And so if 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 you Lamont are out running up and down 202 and you get arrested and taken to our detention center and your file comes up and a prosecutor's office and we say, wow, why was Lamont doing that? And you say I was getting ready for my show and I didn't like what was happening. I decide the prosecutors decide what the full extent of the law is right then and there. And if someone decides we're not going to prosecute that type of activity in this community, you don't get prosecuted. If someone says, you know, I'm going to prosecute him to the full extent of the law, you get charged to the full extent of the law. So, again, it comes down to the grassroots level. And that's, that's one of the reasons I, I just laugh when I when I when I see things like that. And when, when people talk about the national uh, these national positions on things, it, it it's it's national uh, political statements, mm -hmm. but it's local in terms of how it's implemented. It is, it's all local. So the solution for citizens, for a John Q citizen, is to uh, basically put our money where our mouth is. So if, if there's a candidate who we've vetted and we know their position, know their stance, and we see that they have a plan, we have to. It is, it is imperative that we put money behind that candidate to, to, to fund their campaign. It, it is. I want everyone to be aware. One of the the reasons I wanted to to you know address people is there's a lot of talk right now about Christ, um, criminal justice reform and mm -hmm. about defunding the police. Right. And when people talk about criminal justice reform, the first thing they talk about is the police department and and, and changing policies of policing. They talk about sentencing, sentencing guidelines that may not be fair. Certain offenses that get longer times in jail than others. They talk about prison reform and um, and how long people are going to stay in prison, what type of, of training and things they get in, in prison. But that fourth piece has to be dealing with things at your local prosecutorial level. That has to be a fourth level of, um, of, of reform. And the reason I say that, and I take, for example, things that I see in the community every day, we've decided here in Prince George's County, for example, we're not gonna be prosecuted. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of young ladies who uh, um, who uh, may get into prostitution, tricking. tricking. And in a lot of places, that is something that is criminalized. Right. In Prince George's County, you may not be aware, but there's been a decision that's been made that the people who are involved in the sex trade, the actual workers, are not going to be prosecuted. 
Okay. And, I, and I bring that up it, it, because it's one of the more interesting of, of the positions that's been taken, but that's because um, it's been determined that uh, those people need help. And okay. when they come into the system, putting them in jail is not the optimum way to resolve that. So that's how, when you talk about defunding the police and you talk about re, uh, uh, where money is going to go, services for individuals like that, domestic violence. Um, there's a, in the prosecutor's office, there's a wing um, that deals with uh, policy in general. There's a new policy that, that makes strangulation um, a first degree offense. It was not before, it was actually a, a, a misdemeanor. And that's important because in a lot of domestic violence of violent situations, the strangulation that occurs. Right. Everyone's heard about the, the decriminalization of, of marijuana. Um, so that's another uh, type of uh, impact that, that prosecution, prosecutors make regardless or outside of legal policy. Mm, that's interesting. So so the, the new one about the trekking, right? Is that new? That's new? What were they before? What were they classified as for before? <laughs> now it's just a curious narrative. Well, it, it's it's oh, still it illegal. Oh, okay, right. So it doesn't. Okay. And, and, and don't get me wrong. It's it's still an illegal act. Right. It's still an illegal act. But the prosecutor's office has determined that the individuals, and they tend to be younger. They're teenagers, um, and, and sometimes not other people who have may have drug dependency. That the way to rehabilitate them is not through incarceration. Got it. it. The decision that was made at the prosecutorial level is that there are other programs which we would we would prefer to divert people to instead of the criminal system, instead instead of the penal system. Right. Uh, and that's just one of the one of the examples. You know, it, it's funny. I I grew up in the community here, and and. And the reason that I, I, I like being a prosecutor and one of the things that gives me the ability to is when I see the people, when I see people come in, um, I get to, I get to actually make a decision and view who they and look at who they are. And that's something that doesn't happen everywhere. And a lot of people in our community fall into uh, um, several groups. They committed an act, but they were um, they have a history of child trauma. They have a history of loss poverty, victimization, and disengagement from school. You know, regardless of what the criminal act they, uh, they, they did was, it was one of those things that I find the majority of the time led them to the criminal act. And so if I have the opportunity to have them go through something other than the legal system, because the legal system brands you, right. once you're charged, right. regardless of whether you... Uh, you get off or you get probation, it gets uh, a lot more difficult to get a job, um, get into a college, become a member of the bar, even though something may have been youthful indiscretion at the time, it's something that ends up permanently branding you. And I think it's really important for prosecutors um, as part of this criminal justice reform movement to, to sort of look at other solutions. And when you're talking about funding or defunding, I don't support defunding the police. And I don't think that people mean take money away from the police departments. I think they mean reallocate it towards different um, resources. And I think that would be when beneficial. Say, when you say people, though, you, who, who are you meaning? Because a lot of people with uh, a lot of people on the ground in those in these protests, who don't have a clear understanding of what that phrase is, they actually are looking to take money from the police until someone explains it to them. Right. And, and, and there's certain things that the police do that I don't think the police want to do themselves. For example, crisis intervention. Someone uh, in, in your house has some type of disability, mental disability, whether, uh, you know, and even if it's not diagnosed, they're going through some type of episode. The police do not want to be the people who respond. They right. don't. And money can come from the police department to fund crisis response teams. And some jurisdictions do have them and they're almost always underfunded, which send people other than police officers who aren't trained to deal with people having episodes to respond. So if you're talking about rearranging funding so that some other, certain other programs are supported, then I think that they're right. But Anyone who's saying defund the police as in get rid of police departments, I think don't understand the movement. And from my perspective, 
um, from the types of crimes I prosecute, I don't think that people really want to <laughs> the, the police to be defunded because I, I prosecute uh, organized crime and gangs. And you may say you can protect your neighborhood, but until the gangs are, are, are running through the neighborhood and, and you have to go outside with your gun and deal with a group of other people who have guns uh, or cartels are in your neighborhood, you're going to want the police then. So I think it's a, a reallocation more than just getting rid of them. So that's my uh, understanding. As we wrap this up, and uh, this segment is called Against the Law, and we're with uh, Stephen Williams, uh, Maryland, uh, PG County, Maryland uh, 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 prosecutor. Um, as far as like, just let's let's go back to basics. Sure. Getting, getting pulled over by law enforcement. And and what are your rights? Because I see so many videos, right? And and I and I I see the videos where you got the empowered types who are like, you know, I know my rights, and they and they spit, they spit in bars. They like, you know, it's just, you can't so and so and such and such, and I'm letting you know based on code this, that, and the other. And then you'll see you'll see the videos where it's sometimes the police is like, you're right, you're absolutely right, sir. Then you see the other videos where the police are like, I don't care about none of that. You know what I mean? So in, in, that, in that scenario, in that situation, in that moment, we already know that as, as black people and black men specifically, there are different things that we have to do to stay alive. We already know that. But I want to know what are the things that are literally you are entitled to say and do during, let's say, a traffic stop? And, and, and specifically, do I have to show you or hand you my ID? Do I have to roll the window down? And do I have to answer your questions? Those are the the basics because I see a lot of different videos with people doing different techniques and maneuvers and 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 working and then I see a lot of videos where it don't work okay I, in terms of your first one uh, showing identification that can vary by jurisdiction but generally speaking you are required to show identification to a police officer mm. here no I, I don't know if that's I don't know if that's the case everywhere but yes you do have to show identification. Show uh, or, or do, like I can show it, or do I have to give it? Because that's the well, difference. It, 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 typically, they have to have an opportunity to, to see the identification to okay. verify that it is in in fact real identification. It's not a fake driver's license or you know written and typed up on a typewriter. So typically, you have to sh give them okay um, uh, the item. In terms of what what I see uh, is a, a lot of times I hear people being told to get out of the car. Now, that's where you start to have more of a gray area. I'll tell you that the overarching theme is that police have an, a right to do whatever they determine is necessary for, quote unquote, officer safety. Right. So that can entail them patting you down. Then they can't go into your pockets, but they can touch the exterior of your body. That's why they can shine a light into a vehicle when they're when they're walking up beside it to see if they see a, a weapon. Um, whether you actually have to comply with it, I would say you do. Um, and even if you had some legal reason not to, the time to exercise that particular right is not on the side of the road when it's dark, when one of you has a gun and one of you doesn't. Uh, it's, it's just the way it is. Um, and was there a third a third part? Third one is, do I have to answer your questions? You, the answer to the question is no. You have to you have to give um, their name. You have to follow orders, but you do not have to be responsive to questions. You you don't have to answer their questions. Mm. Um, and in fact, a lot of times answering the questions is what is used to give probable cause for them to get you out of the vehicle or to search. For example, do you have drugs in the car or any weapons in the car? You don't have to answer that question, but if you do and you say, yes, there are drugs in the car, there are guns in the car, or my favorite, have you been drinking tonight, sir? Well, just a little bit, it's over for you. Mm. Get out of the car because you just admitted that you were, that you were engaged in criminal activity. But there's no, so real, those there's no real way around them. that though. There's no real way around that. If I, if I, if I have been drinking and I say no, you're just going to say, well, I can smell it. Oh, well, if he, but then he has to, he has the burden of establishing that he smelled the odor of alcohol on your breath. And that is why he ordered you to get out of the car. But when you go to court and you have your attorney, that's the officer who's going to have to say that. And the judge is going to, and the prosecutor for that matter, is going to have to believe them. And I've seen cases where officers have said, 
Uh, I smelled alcohol. And the person has said, we were next to, you know, something was on fire. The building was on fire. I was away from him. And he's saying he smelled alcohol. And the officer may not be believed. Um, But if you admit it, I can tell you, you absolutely can't defend it then. Right. So uh, Kanar has a question. Everything you just said, is it different for walking versus driving? Do you still have to, as a citizen, do you just do everything the same way? Like if I'm walking, right, and you walk up on me, and you're like, yeah, uh, where are you coming from? We're like, I don't, I don't, I decline to answer those questions and keep it moving. You're like, well, let me see some ID. I don't have any ID. Can, can you literally keep it moving if you're not under investigation or the subject of, uh, you know? No, they can, a, a police officer can stop and ask you for identification if he has a reason to stop you. And the, the problem with that in reality is, there will always be a reason why he stopped you. I was investigating this, a person fitting this description, I walked by, what did he look like? Black male between uh, 20 and 30, uh, average height, average build, wearing sweatpants and jeans. That's enough for them to stop you and ask you who you are and to identify yourself. And they can ask for your name and they can run a warrant check. Now that's not authorization to search you or anything like that. Although if the officer feels like he needs to pat you down outside of your clothes for his safety, he could also do that, but it starts to get a little bit, uh, a little bit fuzzier. And if he finds anything, your attorney is going to have a great argument to, to say that that the stop was illegal. Right. All right. Last question. Uh, Everyone is, Blurred Poodle says, everyone is not made aware of these procedures. So how have you, and I'm, I'm guessing she means your office, uh, increased awareness in this area? Well, our office has uh, a lot of outreach. We have, we do webinars, um, we do events. Um, and then a lot of this information is, is just out there to be consumed at a lot of individual websites. And you just have to uh, apprise yourself of it. If she's asking specifically about Prince George's County, I would say you could go to the Prince George's County State's Attorney's website and a lot of those things will be will be laid out for you. But again, as I pointed out, each jurisdiction sort of has different policies and puts emphasis on different practices. So you would have to do that in where you are to know. All right. There it is. Against the law. Uh, uh, Stephen Williams from the uh, Prince George's County, Maryland State's Attorney's Office. I appreciate you, man. Um, I know you, you know, you 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 get paid a lot of money to do this, so to take thirty minutes out your time, we appreciate it. You know what I'm saying? I ain't gonna. Yeah. The questions is, is is going. They just going. I'm like, nah, man. This is. Uh, you got to put him on retainer. We can't. He can't answer it all on the first time. You know what I mean? So hopefully, yeah. uh, if you got some time, man, we'll have you back for against the law, and uh, you drop some more knowledge on us. I would love to do that anytime. All right, thank you. It. Talk soon. Mm-hmm. Great questions, y'all. Um. I didn't get to the last couple, but uh, against the law, that's going to be a new segment. Uh, it, it basically puts all, all the stuff you think you know up against the law, and we find out what really is and what really ain't. And uh, now for our sponsor, man, that that portion of the show, uh, again, we're broadcasting live from Tiny Closet Studios, and uh, that portion of the show is being brought to you by a show called Tiny Kitchen. Enjoy.
All right, there it is. Tiny Kitchen, <laughs> The Lamb of God, Episode 1. Uh, you know it made your mouth water. That's one of our sponsors right there. Uh, shout out to Stephen Williams for coming through uh, Against the Law.